Okay. Hi, everyone joining the call. Um, welcome to our third symposia on uh, topics in audiology. I'm Leah Jacobson. I'm a, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a ear, nose, and throat surgeon from uh, the University of California, San Francisco. And this symposia is put together in partnership with uh, Bugando Medical Center in Tanzania, led by Dr. Buname, the head of the ENT department there. Um, we have uh, lecturers from the University of Melbourne's Department of Audiology giving our talks for the next few weeks. And uh, this is uh, sort of led by Mending Kids, our, our sponsoring organization. So thank you all for your participation. Uh, we'll start the, the meeting shortly here and I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, but if anyone is new and joining, I would love if you could share your um, just your name and what, what country you're from in the chat box. And of course, any questions or can go in the chat. Um, we'll also open it up to a group discussion at the end. So we can all have a chance to uh, participate and ask questions live if anyone is interested in doing that. Um, okay, so without further ado, our next topic is on integrating audiology results with pathologies of the ear with our speakers, uh, Daniel Hanna, Lauren Power, and Shiru Kabanya giving talks today. So thank you all for, for offering to do this. Take it away. Cool. So just before I start, is my screen showing? Just give me a thumbs up. Cool. Hi guys, so my name is Daniel. I'm here with my other two colleagues. Um, so today we will be discussing um, or integrating audiological results with different pathologies of the ear. Okay, so this is the uh, lecture outline for today. So we will be looking at the you know association or the types of the hearing loss with different ear pathologies. Okay, and then we will um, look into the symptoms of the different ear pathologies and also the current treatments or managements um, for these type of different pathologies. So this is just a quick recap from your last lecture series, which was um, on the audiogram. So basically, this is an audiogram, first of all, and uh, we use this audiogram to basically um, measure the hearing levels in patients. So, and the, these hearing levels are measured in dBHL. And in other words, that's the loudness. And this loudness is represented in the y-axis on this audiogram. And on the x-axis is uh, what we have um, the frequency or the pitch. And one other important aspect or feature of the audiogram is what we call a speech spectrum, or also known as the um, speech banana, which we can see on the shaded part um, on the audiogram. So basically, the speech banana encompasses nearly all of the sounds of uh, human language, which is you know, essential for our communication with, with one another. So this is what these are the values we use to basically determine the degree of, of the hearing loss. So 15 decibels uh, being normal, normal range, anything more than 15. So going down the audiogram, so like um, 20, 30, and what so on, those are those values um, identify the, the degrees of the hearing loss. Okay, so just a um, quickly, I'll go through the types of the hearing losses. So basically, um, we have three types of the hearing losses, one being what we call a conductive hearing loss. So basically, a conductive hearing loss is when there is a damage in the, sorry, in the middle ear, okay, that is being the, the tympanic membrane and the ossicles. Okay, and usually those type of hearing losses cause a conductive hearing loss. And the other type of hearing loss is what we call a sensory neural hearing loss. And that happens due to a damage in the cochlea or the hearing organ. So for this first part of my talk, I will be focusing on um, pathologies that mostly cause low frequency types of hearing loss. 
specifically um, being sensory neural. So that sensory neural aspect in those types of hearing losses. So this type of hearing loss, as we can see on the audiogram, is just an example of a low frequency um, sensory neural hearing loss. And also this, this type of hearing losses are also known as a rising hearing loss. So you may ask, how does a low frequency hearing loss affect the patient? Well, like I've mentioned before with the speech banana or the speech spectrum, um, we know that most, most of those phonemes lay in that region. So just by having a hearing loss in that area would actually really affect the patient in, in just everyday communicating. So communication part of the, you know, the, the situation is, is the, the biggest hinder of, of this type of hearing loss. Okay, so now I will be talking about the, um, the pathologies that are associated with low frequency hearing losses. So the first thing that I'll be talking about is many ears disease. So with many ears disease, it's basically when you have an accumulation of the endolymph um, in scalar media, and especially it's in the apical terms of the cochlea. So here we have a um, diagram of a inner ear. So we have the cochlear organ, and we also have the um, semicircular canals or the vestibular part of the cochlea. And basically just by having that buildup of fluids in the um, scalar media tends to lead um, to many years disease. So some of the symptoms that we actually get in the clinic is a patient would come and then they will start complaining about um, having vestibular issues such as you know vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. Then they would complain um, having actually a uh, tinnitus in one of the ear and they always complain that, that one of their ears is actually blocked and it's it's somehow it's filled with um, some sort of you know fluid. That's that's what we get in the clinic. And the way we actually look into many years disease is by taking extensive uh, patient history and just looking for those type of symptoms. Then we um, use a criteria, which we will look into shortly. Um, that criteria is basically called AOHNS. Um, and then after we use that criteria, criteria, we do an additional testing known as electrocochleography or known as the ECOG. So just with this criteria, so this is what we use in the clinic to basically um, determine if it's likely for the patient to have many years disease, okay? So after this um, criteria is completed and if they're the candidate for having many years disease, then what we actually do is we do this um, additional testing. So basically electrocogliography, it's a bit of mouthful, um, it's used to assess cochlear potentials, okay? And we use this um, test to basically, um, it's, an, it's an objective measure to, you know, to identify many years disease, but it's also a verification of wave one on the ABR. And sometimes, you know, um, surgeons and ENTs order this test to basically um, just to monitor the auditory nerve during surgery. And this is a uh, waveform. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into details about um, many years disease because you will have uh, vestibular pathologies in your next lecture series. But basically, um, with this waveform, so what we have to look at first is we have to determine a baseline. Then we have to determine the SP, the somatic potentials, and the um, action potentials. And uh, Somatic potentials is usually separated from the action potential, and action potentials have a larger um, peak than the SP. So these are just the normal values for SP-AP ratios. So they range from 0 0.3 to 0.55. But at the University of Melbourne Audiology Clinic, we use so any, any values less than 0.425 is considered to be um, normal. Okay. So this is, we call this a CDA tray and um, it's used in our um, clinical setting. So 
This is completed once a checklist of the criteria for many years disease is completed and the SP AP ratio is obtained from both of the ears. Okay, so basically this tree gives us the shades of gray we're looking for. Okay, so with the audiological results from many years disease, um, otoscopy would show clear. Usually there's no, um, nothing uh, occluding the tympanic membrane. The biggest giveaway with audiological results is just that PTA. Um, so when we see a low frequency sensory neural hearing loss, um, plus those vestibular symptoms, we straight away think about, uh, is it many years disease? And that's when we do those additional testing. With management, unfortunately, with many years disease, there is no cure. Um, however, there are some treatments. So treatment begins with like conservative measures, such as, you know, having low salt diet, um, avoidance of stress and caffeine, and also sleep. Um, you know, medical therapies sometimes is, is the next step just to treat those um, vestibular symptoms like vertigo, spinning sensations. And sometimes surgery is actually um, considered. It is not very common though, but it's, it just depends on how severe those symptoms are. And this is um, basically a um, algorithm, treating algorithm. Um, so the blue arrays actually refer to the decisions that should be made by all the patients and the red arrows refer to the disease progression. Okay, so this, this algor algorithm kind of summarizes um, all the steps that should be taken when having many years disease and it's used to treat unilateral um, symptoms. Okay, so next up is otitis media with effusion. So basically, um, otitis media with effusion is defined as the presence of fluid in the middle ear without any signs or symptoms of acute ear infection. Okay, um, it may occur spontaneously because of the poor eustachian tube function or as an inflammatory response following acute otitis media. Now, just for those of you who don't know the function of eustachian tube, basically that tube, what it does is it, it clears out fluid and it's connected, um, it's connected uh, in the, it's, it's in the ear and connected to the back of our throats. And it just makes sure that the middle ear is air filled. Now the tympanic membrane with otitis media with effusion is often cloudy with um, distinct impairly impaired mobility and it's an air filled level or like sometimes you see bubbles um, visible in the actual, actual in the middle ear. I'll show you guys photos in the next slides. And um, otitis media with effusion is actually more common in children. And again, it comes to that undeveloped um, eustachian tube or unmature eustachian tube. So when a patient comes to the clinic, they would normally um, complain that they have muffled hearing or some sort of blocked hearing. And um, they would complain that their ear is sometimes it's painful. So the way we would actually diagnose it is just having, having a look in the tympanic membrane. Um, and we would look for things like um, if there is any signs of you know, fluid behind the eardrum. Then we would go ahead and do tympanometry. Tympanometry is actually a good test for otitis media with effusion because it allows us to know if the tympanic membrane is actually moving. And then we, of course, we follow it um, with a hearing test. I will explain those results in the later slides. So this is a uh, picture of the tympanic membrane. Um, with a few, so this is a picture of tympanic membrane that has otitis media with effusion. So we can see that the opaque tympanic membrane and we can see the yellow coloring behind the eardrum. Um, I'll see if I can put my laser pointers. There it is. Okay, so this is the cone of light. This is um, the malleus. Okay, um, 
And we can see that it's a bit of a yellow coloring behind the eardrum. And that's an indication it could be an effusion behind the eardrum. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the air bubbles. So basically, um, when the ear starts to clearing up from the fluid, we see the air bubbles. And that's an indication of the eustachian tube is actually starting to work again. And it's, it's clearing that, that middle ear from, from the effusion. So with the audiological results for otitis media with effusion, it's, it's mostly um, conductive hearing loss. And that's because, that's because the ear is not able to move. Uh, the, sorry, the tympanic membrane is not able to move, um, meaning the sound is, is blocked in that middle ear. And so tympanometry would actually tell us when we do tympanometry, it would tell us it's type B low, meaning that um, due to the blockage of the middle ear, the tympanic membrane is unable, unable to move. And that's why we have a low volume. Treatments for otitis media with effusion is most of the times ENTs would um, use grommets, would put grommets on the patients if it's recurrent ear infection, um, ear effusion. For severe OMEs, antibiotics are also given. And I've put their functional use surgeon tube, it was clears out the fluid. Just like I was explaining before, the role of the surgeon tube is to clear out that, you know, fluid in the middle, middle ear. So a dysfunction in that tube is uh, would most likely make the middle ear more prone to fluid buildup. So next up is perforation. So basically perforation refers to when there is a hole in the eardrum. Now this hole can be caused by many um, many things, you know, such as scratching, you know, your ear canal with an earbud or a car key. <laughs> or by, you know, simply having an ear infection. And basically the symptoms that, that are mostly common in patients with perforation is they would come and complain about having a sudden pain in the, in the ear. We also see a discharge coming out from the ear canal. And following those symptoms, um, patients would complain, oh, I woke up this morning, you know, all of a sudden my hair is dropped. And then with further investigations, we find that maybe this patient was, for example, um, in a car accident or, or a, um, some sort of accident that actually led to perforation. So with diagnosis, again, we sort of um, do autoscopy just to look for that hole in the eardrum, okay? Now with perforation, there's actually a couple of perforations and in the next slide, I'll show you a diagram of that as well. So this is a uh, types of perforations um, and each type of perforation actually leads to a, um, not different, but like close audiological results. So with PTA, most of the times it's, it's conductive hearing loss. Um, and most of the hearing loss happens in the lower frequencies. But again, it depends on the severity of the perforation because sometimes it can happen across the frequency range. Now with tympanometry, it's actually different from OME because with OME, the ear was blocked with fluid. But in this case, the ear has a uh, hole in it. Uh, the tympanic membrane has a hole meaning there is the volume of the um, ear canal and the middle ear is actually combined. And that's why we have a, a high temp um, type B tympanograms, or in other words, the tympanic membrane is not intact. So treatment for um, perforation is basically, most of the times the tympanic membrane heals on its own. So not so much of interference is actually um, you know, like happens. However, for severe perforations, um, you know, surgery is, is granted.
And I've also put a note there for those who actually have perforation, it's good to avoid being in water a lot and getting water in the ear canal because that actually can lead to you know, further infections and other complications. Okay, so that's cholesteatoma and Lauren is gonna take over now. Great, hi everybody, I'm Lauren and I'm gonna take us through the cholesteatomas. So an a cholesteatoma is an accumulation of keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium in the middle ear. So essentially what that is, is it's skin that's building up in the wrong place. When the eustachian tube isn't working correctly, the pressure within the middle ear uh, can pull part of the eardrum the wrong way, creating retraction pockets that fill with old skin cells. When this happens, the buildup of keratin in the middle ear can cause bone erosion and damage to the surrounding structures, particularly the ossicles there. So even though it's technically, you know, just, just that, that buildup of, of skin and possibly infection, it can be quite dangerous for the patient because if that accumulates, infection can spread, which can be quite a cause for concern if it extends beyond the temporal bone, especially if it gets close to the brain. So a cholesteatoma might involve the middle ear, the mastoid, or both. And here we've got just some of the ways that a cholesteatoma could present. We've got a cholesteatoma on the left ear, which is very pearly in appearance and would have been present from birth. And on the right-hand side, we have one that would have been acquired, possibly after a number of infections. Um, and up here, we can see that retraction pocket up the top of the tympanic membrane where that cholestia Toma has been able to form. And so moving on to the next slide, we've got um, symptoms. So we've got occasional discharge and a possibly offensive odor might be present. Um, we've got hearing loss and tinnitus as a symptom from the erosion of the ossicles, uh, particularly incas and stapes is the most common and erosion uh, into the lateral semicircular canal can cause a sensory neural hearing loss as well. Um, if there is erosion into the uh, semicircular canals, we might see a bit of vertigo in our presentation. Um, and as a result of erosion of the bone covering the facial nerve, in, especially in the middle ear, um, that can result in facial paralysis. And we might also see a bit of intracranial complication, um, erosion through the bone um, and abscesses around the sigmoid sinus. So in terms of diagnosis, we wanna be looking out for deposits of skin cells during um, otoscopic examination, looking out for those effective retraction pockets and for pearly masses behind the tympanic membrane. And, and that's really important. We can also get a good idea of what's going on through a CT scan. And here in this picture on the slide, we can get a, uh, a good idea of the difference between the two sides. So we've got a cholesteatoma on the right, resulting in a bit of opacity in the middle ear space. And in this case, we have some erosion on the sputum and the ossicles in there. And we can move on to the next slide now too. So we've got our audiological results. So for PTA, we usually see a conductive hearing loss due to that vesicular damage. Um, however, a large sac can transmit sound well to the footplate of the stapes, even with the erosion of the incus. Uh, so it's quite important to be familiar with the way that these visually present in otoscopy, just to get a good idea of what you're looking for, um, just in case that hearing loss isn't quite there yet. Um, if there's an erosion, into the labyrinth, we might also see a sensory neural hearing loss as discussed in the previous slide. Um, so these losses will be present on the affected side. So unless both ears are affected, we're generally also looking out for unilateral losses. Uh, the tympanometry, uh, it varies with the uh, compliance of the tympanic membrane or perforation. Um, most of the time for established cholesteatomas, we'll see a type B due to the cholesteatoma causing a reduction in the movement of the tympanic membrane, but that can, that can be variable. And we can also have variable pressure there as well. And moving on to the next slide. In terms of uh, treatment or management, if there's an infection, we wanna control that first. Uh, usually it's treated with an antibiotic, but for 
established cholesteatomas, surgical treatment is important. So that might involve uh, mastoidectomy to remove the disease from the bone and tympanoplasty to repair the eardrum. And handing it over to Shiru, who'll take us through the high frequency hearing loss pathologies. Thank you, Lauren. So my name is Shiru and I will be going through yeah, high frequency hearing loss and its associated pathology. So a high frequency hearing loss um, causes difficulty hearing high pitched sounds and those include soft consonants um, such as those produced by the letter S, F, TH or even K. Those tend to become difficult. So common pathologies associated with high frequency loss we could go to the next slide, Daniel. The first one is presbycusis, which is the most common cause for high frequency hearing loss. It is age related. So we tend to see it in more of our older population. And as mentioned before, hearing is worse in the high frequencies and it is more severe in men. So with presbycusis, it involves um, sensory neural hearing loss that gradually slopes for the high frequency, as you can see in the diagram. It is a disorder of the brainstem and cerebral cortex where sorting and processing of the information or speech information occurs. And this can result in um, other social and psych psychological problems related to embarrassment and withdrawal as people who tend to suffer from presbycusis um, would ask for repeats in conversations or just miss out on things that happen and that can result in um, the embarrassment in the jaw. The next slide, please. So the next common cause of um, high frequency hearing loss is noise induced hearing loss. It is a result of damage to the hearing nerves that can be acquired most commonly from occupational hazards, recreational noise or acoustic trauma. Approximately 12.5% of children and adolescents aged 6 to 19 and 17% of adults aged 20 to 69 have suffered some form of permanent damage to their hearing from noise exposure. There are two distinct types of hearing loss from noise exposure that I'll run through today. The first one being noise-induced hearing loss um, that's caused by repeated exposure to sound that is either too intense or too long in duration. And the second one will be acoustic trauma. Next slide, please. So the first one um, is, yes, noise-induced hearing loss caused by repeated exposure. That's when um, there, the sound is either too intense or too long in duration. And as you can see on the audiogram, um, it presents as a sensory neural hearing loss, which is often limited to the three to six K um, region with the greatest loss at 4K and it's shown as a dip on the audiogram. The hearing loss progresses most rapidly during the first 10 to 15 years of exposure and then it gradually tends to slow down. The next slide, please. So this is an unusual um, case of noise-induced hearing loss. I actually came across this on Wednesday and thought it would fit into this presentation really well. So on the left um, is an audiogram of a drummer from when he was 29 years old, um, and this was prior to getting hearing aids. And on the right side is um, his most recent audiogram, and he is currently 42 years old. And as you can see, the shape of the audiogram has changed between the two. However, it's still a bit of an unusual shape for a noise-induced hearing loss compared to the previous audiogram I showed you on the other slide. The next slide, thank you. So this um, noise-induced hearing loss from acoustic trauma is occurs when there's a single exposure to a hazardous level of noise, resulting in a permanent threshold shift without preceding a temporary threshold shift. So a temporary threshold shift would be when you're exposed to loud noise, for example, you go to a concert one night and when you get home, you realize your hearing is a bit low, but then a couple of days later, it returns back to what you perceive as normal hearing. Um, whereas a permanent threshold shift is when that noise exposure was too loud and has 
permanently damaged your hearing. And after a couple of days or even a couple of weeks, it doesn't return back to what you would perceive as normal hearing. So the hearing noise, sorry, the hearing loss is similar to um, the noise-induced hearing loss from before, with the notch at four kilohertz. But there might also be a flat or downsloping loss that is seen on the audiogram. There might also be damage to the middle ear, so the tympanic membrane and the ossicles, as well as the organ of cordy, which is further down. So in the image here, we've got an example of a blast injury to the ear. And as you can see, you've got on the left a um, intact and healthy tympanic membrane. In the middle is when that trauma has occurred and there's a perforation to the eardrum, as Daniel had explained. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of hemorrhaging and the ossicles kind of look damaged and that's a bit hard to see because it's a small image. And then on the right side is now the healed um, tympanic membrane, but there is permanent damage that has occurred and we would be able to see that um, through the hearing tests on the audiogram. So the hearing loss is frequently asymmetrical. It is unilateral in this case, and there can be variability in the hearing loss um, depending on the individual. And usually by the time the hearing loss is detected, as mentioned, there is permanent damage. Um, to see how bad the damage is or the extent of the damage, we can do um, OAEs, so they're useful in measurement. Um, in ears that are suspected of being overstimulated to sound um, due to the well-recognized sensitivity of the outer hair cells in the cochlea. And the next slide, please, Daniel. So the final component is genetic sensory neural hearing loss. So these are congenital hearing loss. Right. Congenital hearing loss accounts for almost 66% of hearing loss from birth in can be syndromic or non-syndromic. Most inner ear malformations arise during the first trimester of pregnancy due to an interruption in the formation of the membranous labyrinth, causing a range of abnormalities that affect different parts of the inner ear. There are a few known uh, genetic conditions that may contribute to a sensory neural hearing loss or a conductive overlay with the sensory neural hearing loss that affects the high frequencies. And I'll run you through this. So the first one on the next slide is Goldenar syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant condition that's characterized by facial asymmetry, pinnal and external ear canal malformations, such as preauricular tags, sinus tracts, microtia, stenosis of the external auditory canal, or ossicular deformity, and also a, an incomplete development of the temporal bone. The hearing loss is, sorry, if we could go back. Thank you. The hearing loss um, in most cases is a conductive overlay with a sensory neural component, and in very rare cases, it can be a complete sensory neural hearing loss. So depending on the pinna and the external ear canal malformations that we see, a hearing aid or a baja would be appropriate to help with the hearing loss. On the next slide, we will go to um, Down syndrome, otherwise known as trisomy 21, which is characterized by a narrow um, external ear canal making it difficult to perform otoscopy and um, see the health of the ear canal. So patients with Down syndrome are also more likely to have middle ear effusion due to a fully functioning eustachian tube. They present with a mixed or a sensory neural hearing loss due to ossicular abnormalities, malformations or erosions and fixation of the malleus and incus due to middle ages. Amplification is recommended even for milder hearing losses. The next one is Alport syndrome, which um, is an autosomal dominant 
autosomal recessive or an X-linked recessive genetic condition. It affects the production of type 4 collagen. It's known to be worse in males and result in a progressive sensory neural hearing loss and kidney impairment. Fourth, we've got mitochondrial disease, which is on our next slide, that affects different body systems, not just hearing. Symptoms um, include progressive deterioration in brain function and seizures in infants and presents with diabetes and sensory neural hearing loss in adults. The disease increases the susceptibility to aminoglycoside autotoxicity, which results in a higher susceptibility to an individual getting a hearing loss. And lastly, we've got Pendrin syndrome on our last slide, thank you, which is an autosomal recessive condition associated with goiter, which is an enlargement of the thyroid gland as seen in this image. And it is also associated with a large vestibular aqueduct. And um, there may also be other abnormalities in the cochlea, such as a Mondini deformity, which then affects hearing as well. So, thank you. I think I just saw a question from Chris. Okay. Oh, just okay. moving oh, on to. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So now we're going to take a look at some configurations that are a bit interesting and don't necessarily fit into a high frequency or low frequency category. And first up is in the case of an acoustic neuroma. So an acoustic neuroma is also known as a vestibular schwannoma. It's, it's a rare benign non-cancerous growth that develops on the eighth cranial nerve or the auditory nerve. So this nerve runs from the inner ear to the brain and it's responsible for hearing and balance. And as you can see from the picture on the slide, that goes quite deep. Uh, the acoustic neuroma is quite deep. And for that reason, otoscopy is usually clear. So it doesn't show up if you're just looking at the tympanic membrane. Um, in terms of symptoms, although there's no standard or typical pattern of symptom development, Hearing loss in one ear is the initial symptom in approximately 90% of affected individuals. So this is also often accompanied by tinnitus on one side. So your patient might uh, uh, mention the ringing or buzzing in, in the affected ear. People might also experience dizziness, balance issues, headaches. And because the auditory nerve is so close in proximity to the facial nerve, some patients might also report facial numbness or tingling as a result of the neuroma pushing up on the facial nerve and disrupting its ability to transmit those nerve signals to the brain. In terms of hearing loss, it's usually gradual. In some rare cases, it can be sudden and other times the hearing loss can also fluctuate. So we might see it worsen and get better. So that's all worthwhile to look out for. And moving on to the next slide. The uh, unilateral loss typically seen in an acoustic neuroma can be expressed in a number of different ways. So typically we're gonna see a unilateral hearing loss on the affected side. The most common configuration for this is a high frequency sensory neural loss. Uh, however, it's been estimated that about 20% of patients will present with an atypical pattern. So for example, it can also present as a flat loss across the frequency range and a cookie bite loss, which worsens a bit in the middle and then improves. A little bit as shown in the picture on the right here. In terms of audiological results, we might also find that other tests such as a patient's speech discrimination might not be consistent with PTA results. So it, it might be worse than expected usually as a result of that nerve disruption. Um, and moving on to the next slide. The gold standard for identification and diagnosis of an acoustic neuroma is through an MRI. We can also assess the presence of a potential acoustic neuroma using an ABR or auditory brain response test, as this will show us how the auditory nerve is responding to sounds. As an acoustic neuroma is not cancerous and it doesn't spread to other parts of the body, if it's small and doesn't cause symptoms, we might only need to monitor it to make sure it's not getting bigger. But if it does turn out to be quite big, we might look for surgical removal of the tumour or to the use of radiation therapy to stop that tumour from continuing to grow. And the next slide. Um, so 
Next up, we have otosclerosis, which is an inherited disorder that results in bony growths in the ossicles, usually the stapes as shown in the picture here. This presence of bony growth results in a reduced ability of the ossicles to move, and this impairs the ear's ability to amplify sound. As such, it can result in a hearing loss. It's most common in middle-aged women um, around the ages of 30 to 49, and symptoms might include hearing loss or ringing in the ears. Uh, in rare cases, vertigo might also be present. On an audiogram, patients with otosclerosis commonly have a conductive hearing loss with a drop in the bone conduction threshold at two kilohertz. And that's called a Carhartt notch, as we can see in the next slide. Yep, as we can see here. Uh, so this notch is pretty unique. And in addition to an absent acoustic reflex, this kind of audiogram is generally thought to be a main indicator of otosclerosis. So we can move to the next slide as well. And so to manage otosclerosis, we might monitor the patient's status and see if the condition is progressing. Mild otosclerosis can be treated with a hearing aid to amplify that sound, but if that otosclerosis has progressed, then surgery might be required. Um, in a procedure known as a stapiodectomy, a surgeon inserts a prosthetic device might go back to the last slide for a second, uh, inserts a prosthetic device into the middle ear to bypass that abnormal bone, allowing the sound waves to travel to the inner ear and allowing some of the patient's hearing to be restored. And now that concludes the presentation that we have for you today on integrating audiological results with pathologies of the ear. Um, we'd like to open up the floor for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was an excellent presentation. A lot of a lot of information and a lot of interesting pathologies were reviewed. So, um, yeah, for anyone on the call, feel free to type in questions into the chat, uh, or or we can um, you can unmute yourself as well and ask. I think um, Chowie, if we can just open it up to, or have it maybe in a gallery view or something. Um, and yeah, the other thing too, we were, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what sort of audiology tests you have available in your country. If you feel like sharing that information, it will help guide our presentations as well to know what everybody's sort of level of um, audiology services available are. So if you're willing to share that, that would be very helpful as well. Sure, so I will just quickly um, brief the type of testing that we actually do here in Australia. Um, well, at the University of Melbourne, basically the way um, kind of the appointments are run is first we would see the patient for a general diagnostic testing, and that's where we take history. We then do peer return audiometry following with a speech testing, that is the AB words. We then follow up the testing with a tympanometry as well. And we do a specialized testing called listiness. Well, that test basically helps us to determine if the patient is uh, a candidate or eligible, or maybe hearing aids would be benefit for the patient. So if the patient um, basically has a hearing loss, we then recommend them to see a rehab audiologist. That's where they um, talk about hearing aids. And it's basically, it's called a hearing needs discussion because sometimes um, a patient might not require a hearing aids. They might probably need a um, assistive listening device. Sometimes the rehab audiologists also, um, they offer just a general communication strategies. So with rehab appointments, it's not always about hearing aids. Now, also during diagnostic testing, um, sometimes a patient comes in and complains that they have a vestibular um, issue, such as vertigo or balance issues. That's uh, when we refer them to a vestibular audiologist where they conduct the required vestibular testing to basically examine um, the vestibular symptoms that they have. We also 
at the University of Melbourne clinic, we have a pediatric clinic. That's where we test children as well. Um, did I miss anything else, Lauren? <laughs> or Shuru? I yeah, think so you've done quite well there. Yeah, so those are the main, main um, clinic types that we have um, currently at the University of Melbourne audiology clinic and yeah. Looks like we have one question from Kasuka in Uganda um, on the relationship between tinnitus and acoustic neuromas. If anyone has any comments on that? Yeah. So I think it's generally believed that tinnitus comes about, so those symptoms come about as a result of the neuroma pressing up on the eighth nerve, so our auditory nerve, and uh, in inhibiting or affecting its ability to transmit signals to the brain. Does that sound good to everybody as well? That sounds good to me. Yep, great, good lovely. To me. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, I'm glad. <laughs> I think if you look at the um, the actual auditory nerve itself as well, you've got um, often the high frequency neurons sort of on the outer components. So interestingly, as the as the neuron is pushing on the outs, outer areas of the of the of the um, of the nerve, you you might actually end up with a high frequency hearing loss and high frequency tinnitus as well, commonly, but not always. Right. Dr. James shared that in Mwanza, they have uh, pure tone average and tympanometry. Awesome. Okay, any other questions? There's, a, there's a, probably a, a few terms that people might not necessarily be aware of. We talked a little, about, little bit about otoacoustic emissions in there. I'm wondering if, if anyone wanted to have a crack at, at explaining what otoacoustic emissions are, any of our team? Putting you on the spot there, guys. <laughs> yeah, so basically OAEs um, is just a, uh, an additional um, testing that we do to test the function of the outer hair cells. Um, yeah, so those yeah. outer hair cells, can I jump in as yeah, well? Yeah, of yeah. Of we'll course, share, yeah. share the question answer. Um, so um, as a result of um, the stimulation of those outer hair cells in the cochlea, so uh, they, they can, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Release an emission. Um, and those emissions are sounds that are, are given off um, when it's stimulated. So um, an autoacoustic emission, if you stimulate a part of the, the cochlea, um, it'll, it'll release a little sound that can be recorded. Yep, well, well put guys. So it's like we're picking up, we're sending in some sound into the ear and the cochlea is sending some energy back that we can measure with a microphone. So it's not too complex, um, but um, it's really got a lot of applications. We use them to, to find out whether whether or not children, like newborn babies, um, have got well, not necessarily normal hearing, but normal function of the cochlea. Um, if you've got fluid behind the middle ear in the in the middle ear space, you can't measure these these little um, uh, this, this energy as well. So so, um, but but if everything's working well, we get a really good measurement. Then it's a good sign. And I know in, in a few countries, I know in Cambodia, they use autoacoustic emissions. In a lot of countries, they use them for a screening for, um, for newborns. So I'd be interested in knowing if any, any countries actually that we've got listed that where you're coming from, does, does anyone have access to an autoacoustic emission machine? I know that's a goal at, in Mwanza to start up a newborn screen. I don't know the latest status on that. Um, and then I think we have some participants from Cambodia who have a newborn hearing screen. I'm not sure if they're still on the call um, and could comment on that.
Um, in the meantime, we have another question. Um, with regards to noise-induced hearing loss, is there a maximum exposure level in decibels over a period of time for either occupational or recreational noise? That's a great question. I believe that there is. I'm not so sure about um, the exact um, number of decibels or the time. I do know that in our university clinic, we do have um, little posters that um, have different like decibels and how long you should listen to certain sounds, like how long you should listen to music with earphones in, how long you should be at a concert for. But I don't exactly remember the specific number. I, I think that specific number for um, occupational is, I think it's averaged over a work day. And I think that's 85 decibels is our maximum. Um, yeah, you don't want to be going too much louder than that for too long at all. Yeah, so that's over an eight hour day. Yeah. And um, so you can be exposed to more, uh, to, to louder sounds, but you have to halve the amount of time that you're exposed for every three decibel increase. So if it's at 88, you can only be exposed to it for four hours. If it's next 91 decibels, you can only be exposed to that for a maximum of two hours where it's at a safe level. And that's why it's really important to have um, really well-controlled spaces where people have access to earphones because that will reduce that. So you, if, if you're in a, a zone and you're being exposed to 95 decibels of sound and there's a ways that you can measure that, you have to be wearing ear protection that will bring that level down to a safe level so that you can still stay eight hours in that um, and, and not be at risk of developing hearing loss. Does that answer your question there, um, Tionga? Yes, it does. Thank you. Question from Puesto Guambale. Does uh, auditory neuropathy disorder present with tinnitus? I think it can. I think it can. Possible. Um, yeah. I think one of the things with auditory neuropathy disorder is that it's it's possible, but it's fairly rare that people will just have auditory neuropathy disorder. Often, people that present with this will have multiple other um, uh, problems, medical issues as well, and tinnitus might be one of them. Um, we often find people will have communication, significant communication difficulties. Um, hearing aids will work and hearing aids, sometimes they don't work well for people with auditory neuropathy, depending on um, the severity of the disease itself. But I would imagine, I don't know for sure, but I think, I think um, tinnitus would probably be one of those symptoms. Anyone else, please feel free to just ask a question. You don't have to put it in the chat either. Another thing that was mentioned, I'm wondering if people um, could respond to this around Baja, so bone anchored hearing aids. This was something that was mentioned in the talks um, about how to manage and help people who have got conductive hearing loss, um, which is a bone, a bone anchored hearing aid. So we've got um, headbands that can, can work. We've got um, uh, surgically implanted abutments that you then attach a Baja onto itself. I'm wondering, um, within any of these countries that people are coming from? Is this something that's, that's being done? Anybody on, on bone anchored hearing aids in your country? I don't think in Tanzania, um, although maybe there is somewhere, but I don't think we've seen many um, 
many in Buganda at least. Do they have a, an MRI machine in Tanzania? They just got one. Yeah, like in the last year. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, if no other questions, maybe we'll wrap a few minutes early. Um, we will send out the presentations. Oops, we have another. Um, Effective management of tinnitus. Are we are we having a tinnitus talk in this series? We are. We are. We do. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, I think it's in a, it's in a couple of weeks. Maybe I want to say I think it's on the sixth of May. I believe. Yeah, Festa. We'll be having a whole lecture on tinnitus in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned, um, and we'll probably go into that in more detail. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining and to our speakers. Um, as mentioned in the chat, there will be uh, the presentation and a recording of the presentation will be sent out. So you'll have some options in terms of reviewing it. And um, I think our next talk is in a couple weeks. We'll be, we'll be sending out an email reminder ahead of time as we've been doing. And uh, yes, thank you so much for joining uh, this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.